friends went on with a doctor, somebody or other, and it's just the most insane thing. I mean, it's these incredibly pretentious Victorian femmes uh, with this doctor by this river in the English countryside and, and uh, it's Lil and Nell and Dolly and Dolly says oh doctor we're, we're so exhausted with canasta surely you have some new little divertissement that you can share with us and he says, well, Dolly, uh, I do have uh, this, uh, this uh, little case of uh, the best Moroccan hashish bonbons from Paris. And they say, oh, my. and then it, and it's, it's madness. I mean, uh, it, it's just the most extraordinary thing. Um, yes. <laughs> Does cannabis, cannabis work on the brain or chemically? Does it stop? Or? It's not very well understood. Uh, there is a receptor, uh, but cannabis is not an alkaloid. Cannabis is technically a polyhydric alcohol, uh, which makes it a chemically unique type. It's also bot botanically unique. Cannabis is what's called a monotypic genus. In other words, uh, these three species, Ruteralis, Sativa, and Indica, which are all obviously speciated within historical time and can, by chromosomal studies, be shown to be all derivatives of Rusula, the Central Asian wild type, uh, it has no near relatives. Uh, and so it's, it's unique and it's not well understood. As far as somebody asked about using it psychedelically, I think that the real, and I can't say I do this because I need it for other reasons, but in terms of the pure psychedelic issue, the way to do cannabis is once a week in silent darkness, alone, with the best stuff you can get, and then just, you know, do as much of it as you can possibly do in a shorter time and sit with it you will every single time be absolutely torn to pieces by it, you know. I mean, it is just astonishing. The problem is that people get into it, myself included, for other reasons than that hallucinogenic uh, uh, flash. But that would really be the ideal way. And also it would prove you were a person of great rectitude and self-control <laughs> if you could do that. Yeah. Um, in one of your books, um, you mentioned the idea of a nostalgia for paradise um, as part of uh, perhaps the collective unconscious. Um, and maybe that was formed during the psilocybin paradise period. Mm -hmm. um, do you see um, in, the, in 2012 um, us having to uh, abandon that, or uh, will it be fulfilled by that? Well, this phrase, nostalgia for paradise, I, I don't know who invented it. When I, I first encountered it in Merciliad's book, uh, Cosmos and History, which if you've never read this book, it's a little book. It was one of the most influential books on my thinking because I saw there a whole different way of talking about uh, uh, spiritual reality. Uh, but I disagree with Iliad that it is uh, simply a, a attitude in the human mind. I really think there was a, a fall and that this is a diminished condition and that there was some kind of cohesion that we do have this nostalgia for. That's why I think our whole relationship to drugs is all about the fact that I mean, look here. Here's the metaphor. Uh, we're like the children of an abused relationship. Something was taken from us 15,000 years ago. It was the thing which kept us in balance with each other, with the earth. It kept us in our imaginations, in the poetic world of natural magic. And then it was taken from us. 
and it was a big downer and life turned into history and warfare and subjugation and classism and all of these things and uh, and the thing that was taken from us was was this intoxication and so then we moved on to alcohol to money to opium uh, because that was very big in the Minoan phase I mean opium had a huge influence on Minoan civilization uh, and all of these things, an effort to scratch an itch that you can never quite reach. And, but in the meantime, all kinds of addictions, wars, criminal syndicates, horrible things go on. Uh, now, in the 20th century, through the science of anthropology, a complete inventory, essentially, is taken of the world's uh, intoxicating possibilities. It's part of a complete inventory of the world's people, languages, technologies, uh, belief systems that characterizes anthropology. But there it is. In 1953, Gordon Wasson returns from the village of Watla de Jimenez in the Sierra Mazateca, and he has the body of Eros, you know, pickled in a jar, lost since the fall of Minoan Crete, but suddenly restored. And then nobody knows what to make of it. And the CIA looks at it, and Hoffman looks at it. And, uh, and now it is found, I think. And uh, I don't know if it comes too late, or if the final irony is that we learn what it was all about, but nevertheless have to succumb to the momentum of our own stupidity. In other words, it's some kind of Greek drama where you have this horrible realization and fully understand the whole bit, but you're doomed anyway just because it makes for better theater, or whether it is the, you know, the, preferred, the happy ending of the Christian eschaton. Uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. I want to know what the ninth century's best tools were uh, for cognizing these kinds of matters were... Uh, scholastic theology and I, I've been accused of that been accused of that uh, <clears throat> so what scholastic theology says is that there is something called uh, the nunc stands the, the, the eternal now and that somehow well it, this all goes back to this wonderful thing which Plato said Plato said time is the moving image of eternity and uh, my notion of what this is all about is that the time wave we looked at last night is, is eternity. It's the fractal structure of the temporal module viewed from a higher dimension. And then time is the traversing of that thing. The nature of the singularity is hard to anticipate if you use the old fractal principle of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Do you all understand what that means? It, it's the phenomenon of that a fetus, as it develops, ontogeny, recapitulates the evolutionary history of life on the earth. That's uh, phylogeny. In other words, the, the fetus is first a little kind of a thing, an amoeboid mass of cells, and then it becomes sort of like a salamander, and then it becomes like a... a you know, a, a primitive mammal and so forth and so on. Well, using that principle to try and anticipate the end state seems legitimate in the fractal, under the fractal dispensation. However, it leads to the conclusion that when you look at an organism, what happens to all organisms is that they die. So then does that, that leaves you with the conclusion that what happens at the end date of the of the the whole enchilada is the equivalent of some kind of mass dying. Well, then that really doesn't tell you much because we don't know what dying is, you know. We don't know whether that means that how can the ultimate novelty be complete extinction? It must be then that we have to overcome as positivists our phobia against this area of speculation previously presided over by beady-eyed priests and actually take it back 
and say that in the mysteries of metabolism and morphology, it is perhaps now necessary to entertain the idea that death is not ne- a nihilistic release into non-entity, and that instead the shamanic model is correct, and that l- biological life is a sojourn into matter, and that at death, you know, you do go to some incomprehensible unfoldment, only the first moments of which can be made sense of. Because I really think the DMT thing is like bungee cording into the bardo. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there you go. And then just as you're, it jerks you back. And... Uh, and so you get that much of a look into the yawning grave. And I take it as, a, it's strange, yes, but surely reason for hope and optimism. Uh, how much of oneself, whatever that means, is going to be carried over, it, I don't know, but it looks to me like probably not much. And, and that, but what lies ahead is, well, to, to quote, uh, Bilbo Baggins, uh, <laughs> the greatest adventure still lies ahead. I'm pretty convinced of that, uh, which surprises me because I'm a cynic, and a, and a you know, I'm not easily swept into optimism. <laughs> My yeah. Well, you just had a, a great little pre-echo here. Uh, analogy with scholastic theology lets us know what is going to be the defining event of 2012. The collected works of uh, Terence McKenna are published under the title Summa Mycologica. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, What what cautions and reservations do you advocate in like this this dance with Kali? And I I mean, we we talk about the revival of the (coughs) and and sometimes I wonder if we remember what we're talking about. And that, that in this in this possible great ecstasy there lies many Some danger. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm conscious I am constantly asking that question as I have uh, taken a four and a half year break from drugs and moving back in that direction and having consumed some mushrooms recently and, and wanting to like in this revival of, of, of the use of these substances, I feel like I need to be absolutely reverent and to uh, and to be sensitive to um, to what I'm doing. Okay. Well, there the danger. I mean, as I see it, and I feel it very strongly. And I don't, you know, the danger is, uh, just to put it out there, is madness. I mean, we talk about stretching the envelope. We talk about running the edge. But you don't want to rip the envelope. You don't want to island yourself in a situation where nobody can make sense out of what you're saying. And yet, that's the game we play. It's always pushing. So what you said about reverence and absolute impeccability of attitude. And also, I think it's very important to be physically together. You know, I mean, I... It's important to be physically together anyway. I go to a gym three days a week, and I think of it as preparation for psychedelic voyaging, because if your body is a clean instrument, uh, you can do it. The other thing is uh, technique. I mean, in the psychedelic state, if there are problems, there are techniques to deal with them. The best technique, and uh, Western people don't um, naturally gravitate toward this, but if if you get into a place you don't like on a psychedelic, uh, sing. You must sing. Uh, Most people's tendency is to clench this is very bad because it can just grind you to nothing. What you have to do is you have to sit up and you have to sing, and it doesn't really matter what you sing. You will find the song. I mean, start out with row, row, row your boat and go from there. Uh, And uh, the other thing is, you know, the real issue I find in myself is surrender. 
that it's all very fine to sit here getting paid dollars per minute extolling this stuff, but boy, is it different to do it. You know, you can talk all you want, but um, the the thing is so, I don't know if scary is the word, but it's such a, it's so total what happens. And you're so vulnerable and you know that if there is any flaw, if there is any flaw in your approach or attitude, that that flaw will be magnified by the stress of the thing and become highly problematic. So it's all about asking the question, you know, am I ready? Now, this is not, a, this is not how, how beginners approach it, nor should they. It's incredibly forgiving of, uh, of first, second, and third timers. But as it takes you in, what it gives is a certain measure of, for want of a better word, let's call it power, and the payback on that existential validity would be another way of calling it rather than power. The payback on that existential validity is that you have to be okay. And, you know, maybe it's my Catholic upbringing or something, but one cannot do the examination of conscience carefully enough because there is, there's always flaw. So it's about, you know, staying right with it. It teaches the right way to live and also surrender. That's why I don't ever have an agenda. I regard having an agenda as, as essentially aspiring to be a magician of some sort. And I don't. I don't. I want to witness it. I am perfectly content to be present at the miracle. I don't want to do the miracle and I don't want the miracle to be done to me. I just want to, to be there. Uh, Frank Herbert in his book Dune said something which over the years I've found, though it sounds flimsy to say, it actually works. You, some of you may recall that in that book they had this drug called Stroon, and it did pull you out through time. It was not just a drug. It, it revealed, like I'm saying psilocybin and DMT do, uh, the real structure of reality. And in there they discuss what do you do about the fear that comes with the, the gigantic, awesome dimensions of this vision. Uh, and he says, uh, or someone tells uh, the main character, fear is like a wind, and it blows through the mind. And what you must do is you must wait. And it cannot sustain itself unless you give it an object. And... Uh, this is actually true, I found, that fear, whatever it is, cognitively, physiologically, it's a chemical wave of release of adrenaline. And what you do is you just sit and watch it come like a bell curve and then recede, and then you're still on the surface of the ocean and the power of it has been defeated. But if you... If you give it any object to cling to, you know, it will break white water and then the chaos will overwhelm you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk about the difference between um, psilocybin and ayahuasca experiences. I'm, I'm particularly interested, I heard you talk once about how the value of those <coughs> value in psilocybin experience and more technological and, you know, get ready to depart the planet kind of value, whereas ayahuasca is more save the planet. Feminine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, somebody once said to me after they took a mushroom trip, they said, I don't think I'll do that anymore. And I said, why not? And they said, because I'm not interested in insects that drive spaceships. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> uh, which are, sums up psilocybin pretty well. Uh, it, psilocybin is Apollonian and hortatory and grandiose. And it's interesting that they have these personalities. I mean, psilocybin is, is kind of megalomanic. I mean, it says, history is ending. 
prepare for the departure. The crisis of the species is upon us. Cosmic forces are intersecting. Machines the size of Manitoba will be involved. And, and it's all about, you know, mankind prepare to depart for the higher orders of the Galactarian hegemony and this whole thing like that. And ayahuasca is all about how rivers flow and family lines intersect and what is in the river and what is in the mind of the woman and what is... It's like this very sensual telepathic gas which spreads out when you're in the rainforest and brings you into connection with everything. It's also... It doesn't speak. It's you. It becomes like uh, the eye of a camera. Its language is entirely a visual language. It never speaks. It just shows you, showing, showing, showing. After a good ayahuasca trip, you feel like your eyes are falling out. I mean, you have been looking, literally looking with full attention for hours at this stuff with this, you know, this um, sense of it being distanced from you somehow. Can you reconcile those two different... No, it's a little puzzling because uh, DMT is the uh, psilocybin in brain in the metabolic pathway doesn't actually become DMT, but it's as, about as close as it could possibly be. So the difference is quite startling. Um, and and then, then DMT, when smoke, not when taken in the ayahuasca situation where you get what I just described, but when smoked, like it trumps the psilocybin. It goes so far beyond it because it carries you into the part where you can understand. The other one, the psilocybin communicates at least in human terms. I mean, apocalyptically, mega, technically, through these science fiction metaphors and so forth. But the, the, the DMT flash goes beyond that and you say, this is truly the presence of an alien mind. This is not being filtered for my consumption at all. This is absolutely uh, just off the wall, whatever it is. Yeah. That's right. So it's puzzling that the route of administration and the complexing with the MAO inhibitors gives it these different psychological tones because I think almost everybody who's experienced these things would agree with what I said about these aspects of the personalities of the of the substances no lsd is different lsd is like psychoanalytical drano it's not a personality it's uh, you mean the morning glory seeds and i've only taken those things five or six times in my life and all in my youth and I remember the visions. I remember the hallucinations. Uh, once on Hawaiian Woodrose, on Argeria Nervosa, I entered into an entire world based on the theme of the sea urchin. And I was in these cathedral-like vaulted spaces, which were the insides of sea urchins. And then there was this coach that was pulled by by these very strange-looking animals, and it had these nipple-like protuberances all over it and everything was done in mauve and purple and white and it was just sea urchin world for about 20 minutes and then that went away. Could you explain, um, and I know this gets back to a basic premise and what we've been talking about the last couple of days, but elaborate a little more on why you conclude that these hallucinations are in fact true hallucinations. In other words, why do you conclude that these alpha-like entities really exist? Well, really exist. True enough. We we talked about that, didn't we? About the Wittgensteinian thing, did we? Yes. yes. They're true enough because they have efficacy. You see, uh, we miss the point because we think the world is made of matter. Matter is simply a concept. The world is made of language. And since the hallucinations communicate in language, they are, as, they are as real as anything else. They are helping make reality. 
uh, the, it's crazy to think that the universe is made of quarks and mu mesons and neutrinos and stuff like that. I mean, who here has ever seen one or has the, even the most specious grasp of how you would go about looking for such a thing? But we get exposed to those words. The world is really made of language, of interlocking concepts. Well, so then that means that the hallucinations are real. That in that sense where Mia Farrow says in Rosemary's Baby, my God, this is actually happening, that's what needs to happen inside the psilocybin trip. We have this category called hallucination or intoxication, or trance. And then we say, oh, it's only mental, and therefore it's not real. Well, I've got news for you. <laughs> it's all mental, and therefore it is real. And the, and the big news is that while we've been waiting for aliens to come in ships from the stars, we have totally overlooked the alien nature of reality around us. And that by pushing into these mental dimensions, we discover a bewildering uh, fauna of uh, angels, demons, helping spirits, ancestor spirits. I don't. I only speak from my own uh, experience. So, for instance, I'm unable to pass judgment on something like voodoo, uh, or or uh, I, you know tantric and vocation or something like that. But I would, I, using reason, was able to confirm the existence of things that no reasonable person believes in. And, you know, this is impressive. And it's repeatable. That's the thing I want to stress. This is not some faith or something where you have to, you know, I don't know. It's just that it's a technology it's a technology of ethnopharmacology. Obviously, the experience is repeatable, but what that experience means and whether it, it indicates some, for lack of a better phrase, objective reality separate and apart from your mind is, is not necessarily proven by having, having the experience itself. Yes, but see, it's difficult to prove that there's any objective reality apart from your mind anyway. Yeah, I mean that, but but it's it's not only it don't not only rests on Berkeley, which is an earlier version of it, but it also rests now on quantum physics need to include the observer into the equation. Somehow there is a something, which the which the vectors of which are collapsed into the experience of the here and now by the observational act, and then the role of language in this. I mean this is. It's not easy to sort this stuff out. Uh, if you want to read an interesting book, read Despanet's book, The Philosophical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. This will give you something to chew on for sure. So, somebody, yeah. Oh, that it, well, that it has no character? or And by character, I meant personality. I didn't mean to... It. I just meant it doesn't organize itself around uh, a personality the way psilocybin does. I found LSD to be like a conceptual enhancer. It was great for looking at things and for thinking about things. And uh, but I also, and this may be my my, and obviously is my personal thing. I found it just physically incredibly hard on my body. I mean, my God, the next day I would lay in warm baths and try and sort it all out. And that seemed, and I was taking good LSD, I mean, Sandoz LSD. So uh, I, for me, when I got to psilocybin, I was just exultant. Because see, what I had done is I'd read Huxley, then I'd gone back to Havelock Ellis, The Dance of Life, and Henri Michaud, the miserable miracle, and people like that. And Havelock Ellis talks about ruined buildings of great antiquity drooping with opalescent jewels and protruding from Venusian forests. And I said, that's what I'm after, you know. And LSD would never even approach that. It was much more 
mechanical and elusive and fast moving. Well, then when I took psilocybin, lo and behold, it was just like Havelock Ellis, produced and directed by Havelock Ellis. Uh, and that is what I love. It may just be a prejudice of mine, but to me, the, the transcendental uh, part of it is the vision. Because thoughts you can have, and even insights you can have, but to have behind your darkened eyelids a huge Technicolor movie going on for minutes and minutes, stunning in its cohesion and beauty and architectonic, triumphal. I mean, you just say, wow, this is great, this is great. Who's doing this? And and the thing, if you appreciate it like that, it will say, oh, you, you think that's something? Look at this. And then it starts trying to impress you. And you say, yes, do it. Just take me. I'm yours. Go, go, go. <laughs> yes. Could you say something about the uh, information that's revealed through the drug-induced state and dream? Oh, good question. Uh, I think that it, that perhaps dreaming is, you know, that perhaps every night we go as deep as these psychedelic drugs take us. There's, but there's something about, um, there's apparently very little short-term or long-term memory trace laid down mm. by these experiences. I think if we would just legalize these things and turn our creative science people loose on this, uh, what we really need is a drug that allows you to remember your dreams. That's it. And pardon me. Well, we have the concept and we have claims, but I mean one that will work for me. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's a good point. The one argument that I feel the force of against cannabis is that. Uh, it completely suppresses dreaming. I well, it's it's debatable. My I think that because it's a boundary dissolver, that I have sort of a pressure theory of dreams, and that somehow cannabis depressurizes the dream place because you deal with this material in active fantasy. But boy, if you stop smoking. If you're a regular cannabis user and you stop smoking, within 48 hours you will have dreams that will have you on the phone to mother. I mean, <laughs> and it goes on and on. Uh, I stopped smoking cannabis about a year and a half ago for four months. And uh, these, it, what finally sent me back to it is the dreams convinced me I was losing my marbles and then <laughs> enough of making a point, you know. Uh, had, and, and it was accessible to my rational mind. It was like my rational mind was in place enough to know that I had indeed dreamt it and that I was re-dreaming and absolutely recollecting and reliving the dream state I and mean, the previous dreams that I had really? the last like, month or so. And where were these Amanitas from? Uh, Michigan. Michigan. And and what other what were the other symptoms like? Were, did you feel cold? Um, threw up about ten times, but that was you know it was okay. Did you hallucinate? It was totally as though I was dreaming. Uh huh. Really, I was just absolutely immersed. I was catatonic. I mean, I did not move. First. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, we didn't talk much about Amanita muscaria. Amanita muscaria is a very mysterious because uh, it, it is so variable over its range. Uh, it's chemic, you know, it, it's seasonally variable, genetically variable, uh, geographically variable, and so it's the you hear once in a while an amazing Amanita story. Most Amanita stories are that it's toxic and horrible, but maybe one in 15 stories will be something just wonderful like this. And it's, I'm convinced that, you know, it, it has to do with some very subtle 
chemical equilibrium that people find and lose. And probably when Amanita shamanism was flourishing, it was a case of where you really did have to go to a master to sort out how to do it without wasting your time or poisoning yourself. I really did initially think I was dying. I mean, I knew I was being poisoned, and, but it was all right. I had willfully entered into it with the sense that I wanted a death. Not a physical death, per se, but I wanted to experience the Bardot. Uh-huh. And, and so it was like a willingness to be, you know, to, to feel poisoned. And so, you know what I mean? It wasn't a negative thing. It was something that I had willfully sought. And was it the muscarinic poisoning, chills and salivation? Yeah. And, uh-huh, uh-huh. But it was okay. I mean, it was just because it, it was as though I had accepted total responsibility that that was a willful act on my own part. And so it didn't look as, you know, like... No, I... I say, you know, what is death? I mean, to me, you can look as, is death birth or is death... That, and, and it was as though I was participating in a birthing. I mean, it was just, I focused on that aspect of it. And so I was not merely dying, I was birthing myself. And, and so it didn't have the negative, um, I didn't get ill by it. I mean, uh-huh, I understand. I'm up and I'm sick, it's, I'm not, you know, it's as though another LSD trip I had just previous a few weeks before that was I had all these energies, you know, just hitting me and, and the idea was this voice just kept saying, pick and choose, anyone to you. And so it became very apparent that you could get paranoid and just indulge in that aspect, my God, I'm dying. And, and yeah, well, the ego, this is what the ego tells you as its last desperate right. ploy. Uh, let me say to the group, as far as Amanita and Muscaria is concerned, don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> uh, I mean, this it's, you, you know, out there on the edge of the bardo. I think, though, I mean, I hear what you're saying. If you're truly psychedelic, uh, the difference between living and dying is quite immaterial. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, it's just really you know, do you want, do you manifest it in your mind or in languaging the sense this is death, I'm dying, 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 or do you just transmute it and you say, this is death, I'm, I'm being born, I'm being born, I'm being born, and, and you manifest the reality. I mean, that's whether you are dying, actually, or whether you're being born. I mean, it's kind of almost the same thing. Yeah, this is the issue of surrender, because boundary dissolution is interpreted by the ego as death. And if the boundary dissolution is happening rapidly or for some reason in an alarming fashion to the ego, it will pull out this explanation. And then you really have to discipline the hind brain and say, you know, no, this is what we chose to do. This is the course we're set on. And this is the course we're sailing. Uh, Because, you know, what are you going to do? Um, how has taking the drug you've taken over the years affected your uh, familial relationships and your life generally in terms of your happiness? And that sort of thing. Well, it's hard to say, you know, because you ask about a path not taken as well as a path taken. Um, all the women I've ever been with were heads of some sort, uh, of varying and lesser degrees. Uh, I was married for 15 years. We're separated. Um, I don't, I don't see the drugs as a particular issue. Uh, Although my wife used to complain that I spent a great deal of time sort of out of the flow of family life and loaded. But on the other hand, I remember when I was eight and nine years old, huge scenes with my father and my mother because they were always going off on picnics or something and I always wanted to stay home and read. So it was exactly the same pattern before drugs appeared in my life. I've always been... I I like to do things by myself a lot. Um, 
I, I think uh, I was, I mean, cannabis for me was really a turning point. I remember the first time I smoked cannabis and I realized, aha, I can be a normal person with this stuff. I can self-medicate myself and I can stop being this incredibly hyperactive, nervous, yammering, skinny, bespectacled, Ichabod-like creature <laughs> that I was. And, and and then, I don't know, I mean, I leave it to you to judge the result, but uh, <laughs> my impression was that it helped with that, that I and it helped with my social relations, because I was always so alienated and... Uh, and uh, peculiar. Uh, but my life has been so totally about drugs that I can't imagine it any other way. One of the things that most horrified me when I stopped smoking cannabis, and I've al I had always said it about cannabis, was uh, you worry. You worry. People who don't smoke cannabis worry. Now, they would say that they're tending to business and that that's part of being an adult. But most worry is superfluous and preposterous. And, you know, if I don't smoke pot for a week, I become very attentive to stuff like balancing my checkbook, <laughs> receipts, get deeply into receipts, uh, and just all this weird stuff, you know, and I start thinking, you know, gee, uh, is my medical insurance paid up? Or uh, I, uh, you know, I should prepay my taxes and uh, all this kind of thing. Uh, now, I suppose to go too far in the other direction, you would just be a complete space case. But my life seems to function very well, and people say I have an abnormally neat apartment, so I don't think I'm, I'm letting down too much. Uh, but anxiety is, uh, is a very dubious thing, I think, and anything that assuages that, as long as it doesn't sedate you, is probably a pretty, a pretty good thing. Your presence makes me think it's not as eccentric as it probably actually is. So I appreciate your contributing to my own delusional uh, state. I hope you found this information interesting. Uh, you know, avoid gurus, follow plants. It's like Van Morrison says, no guru, no method, no teacher. Just you and me and Mother Nature in the garden in the garden, wet with rain. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>